I was born in 1943 in Brooklyn, Kings County Hospital. At the time, my dad was in the Army, and my mom was uh, working for the federal government in some type of intelligence thing. I graduated Massapequa High School in 1961. I wrestled all the way through high school. I played some football, too. And I went on to Hofstra University. I got a draft notice, and I notified my uh, draft board in Great Neck. I'm still in college. They said, let us know when you graduated. So I graduated in January 66, and right after that, I got another draft notice. So my dad actually brought me down to Fort Hamilton. So they take us into this room. We're about to be inducted into the Army, all of us. And then all of a sudden, these two Marines walk in and dress blues. And uh, they looked very impressive. So um, they, they said to us, one of them said, we're looking for volunteers for the greatest fighting force in the world. And I looked at them and a couple of thoughts went through my head. I said, well, I'm on my way to Vietnam and I bet I'll have a better, I have a better chance of surviving with the Marines. And I love to surf and I'll bet I could surf while I'm in the Marine Corps. So I raised my hand. I didn't know anything about Vietnam. I was a poli-sci major and I studied, you know, things about communism and fascism and democracy. But on my way to Vietnam, or shortly before, I, I picked up a book called Street Without Joy. It was a very serious account of how the French had been defeated. So I read that book before I got to Nam. In August of 67, there was a problem down south, southwest of Da Nang. Well, the first valley we went into was called Happy Valley, and that's where I had my first, my first Marine was killed, a machine gunner, and he was killed by friendly fire. And not only that, he, he had already finished his tour, and he shouldn't have been with us. And it really, it, ma it made me like, it, it really, it was, it was a horrible thing for all of us to experience that. Then we moved on into another place called the Quezon Valley, which was called the Valley of the Walking Dead. So we go in, and we're moving along, and Charlie Company has points for the battalion, and Bravo is on the right flank, and I'm point for Bravo. And I'm moving along with my platoon, and we, and we go up on this hill. But Charlie Company, their point platoon is out in this, right, this uh, dry rice paddy, and just before they make the tree line, they get ambushed. I mean, big time. And we can't get to them. You know, they're out there by themselves, whole day. It was getting dark. It was, in fact, it got so dark you couldn't see. Uh, you couldn't see anything in front of you. Uh, they started uh, with illumination, so all you, but all you could see was smoke. You could hear the M16s, you could hear the AKs, you could hear men screaming, but you couldn't see anything. Staff Sergeant Head uh, comes down the hill. Uh, they, you, know, and you could see him, the illumination went off. And he came down the hill, he was like running and falling. But he came down, he came, and he came right over to me and Ca Captain Landis, and he said, you got to go, you got to go back up, there's Marines up there and they're alive. So I heard Landis say to the battalion commander, we have to go up. And my Marines were already online, so we started up. But the thing was, we couldn't open fire. I'm, I'm in the middle of two squads of Marines and we're running our way up, and we can't see anything. And I'm, told, I'm telling them to hold their fire. And I'm, I really thought, I really thought this is it. I'm going to get killed. I, I really had those thoughts that this, I'm going to die on this hill. And I was very calm um, going up. And I was thinking about my parents and my wife. What were they doing right now? Is that weird? 
we got near the crest of the hill and the NVA were leaving. They actually were, they were, they were, they were leaving. But my whole squad on the hill, every one of them was hit. Every one was hit. And the machine gunner who had replaced Joe Lestorti, he was only with us for three days, he was dead. His name was David Calabria from Texas, big, big kid. So I'm, I'm on top of the hill now uh, with my two squads. And Captain Landis comes up to the hill. And he, sh he shouldn't be there. No, he shouldn't be on, the captain shouldn't be on the hill. And he's standing near me, and I said, I'm going out. We start down the hill, and every once in a while, an, illum an illumination round goes off, right? So we freeze, we get down, we freeze. And we got to the base of the hill, and at the same time, we both heard something, and we looked over to our right, and an illumination round, an illumination round went off, and it was an NBA soldier. He was like, right where he is, right there. And he was, I guess he was trying to, you know, crawl away. So I got a really good look at him. And um, he was, he was big. I say, you know, he's about 5'8", really good shape. His hair, you know, close crop hair, handsome. Uh, he was wearing khaki pants and Ho Chi Minh uh, sandals, and he was bare chested. And I didn't see any wounds on. I didn't see any wounds on him. And this guy Davis alongside of me, he turned. You know, he turned to shoot him. And I grabbed his arm and I said, "Don't shoot him. Use your bayonet." And he went over and he. That's what he did. He got on top of him and used his bayonet. But that young, you know, that young NBA soldier, I, uh, later on I would think to myself, he's just, uh, you know, he's like the, the counterpart of a young Marine. I, I didn't fire a round, but I thought to myself, this is all about luck. It's just about luck. Uh, there came a time in the um, latter part of April, on the north side of the Quaviat, a battle started, and it was, you know, it was big. And we walked right through what was left of the 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines lines. Just like you would see on a movie, you just walked through their lines, there were dead Marines everywhere. And some, dem and some dead, no Vietnamese, but a lot of dead Marines. And as we were advancing, I was, I was moving with Charlie, uh, Charlie One, the first platoon. I always moved with them because I had a good friend who was a platoon commander, Lieutenant Higgins. And we were moving along and we came across, uh, I called it a ditch, but it really wasn't a ditch. It was about 30 feet long, about six feet wide, maybe about five feet deep. And it was filled with dead Marines. But every one of them, was facing outboard and in the in and still in a fighting position. They they just died right and with multiple wounds. Uh, and the NVA were falling back so fast that they didn't they didn't take any weapons, they didn't mutilate anybody. But I did watch the um, we had the chaplain was actually we had one chaplain for each battalion. Chaplain was actually moving with us. And I watched him go down into this deep ditch, and I watched what he did. And he, I, he took his index finger and his pinky, and he closed the eyes of all the Marines. A crazy thing. We're in a graveyard, in a Buddhist graveyard, and the graves are like 10, 12 feet high, so it's great cover. And we had a, uh, a forward air controller was above us in one of those little uh, Piper Cubs. He was circling around us and, and he radios down and, I could, and I'm, I'm near the captain. 
and I can hear all the traffic. And he says, you got to pull back. He says, he says, I've never seen anything like this. There are thousands of them, and they're coming right at you. So all of a sudden, me and the gunny are by ourselves in the graveyard. I look forward, and the MVA are now coming into the graveyard. And there's nobody around, just me and the gunny. And I just said to him, well, I'll cover you and you cover me. So we had to like leapfrog back a couple of hundred meters by ourselves. It was one of the most frightening things I've ever done. Because every time I turned my back, I thought I was gonna get shot in the back. We did it. Um, I was, the gunny reached our lines first and then I, and then I had to go like maybe 20, 30 meters more and I ran like hell, I was, I was so frightened. And as I, as I was approaching the lines, I heard these two loud blasts, shotgun blasts. Lieutenant Higgins, who had the first platoon, he comes over to me and he says, do you know what just happened? And I said, no. He said, he says, I got two of them that were right behind you. They were right behind you. Turns out, we didn't know this, we were fighting 8,000 North Vietnamese. And they had something in mind. I, mean, they, I think they wanted to cross the Quaviet and overrun um, the Dong Ha combat base. It would have been a disaster if 8,000 of them had moved into the perimeter. But it turns out in Marine Corps history, it's, it's uh, one of the battles that they mentioned at the uh, Marine Corps History Museum is the Battle of Dai Do. Uh, the last, well, the last place before Vietnam was Okinawa. I was waiting for my flight to go out. Actually, we, we were being held up because of a typhoon. And uh, I look over and I see at the bar, my commanding officer, he was Captain Duffy. So I went over to him and he's complaining to me about how he hasn't been able to get to Vietnam and he's a career officer and he needs time on the line, I mean, you know, in combat. And I left, you know, he, he was really angry. I left to go to Vietnam. In December of 1967, and we're on a hill in Vietnam called Alpha 3, uh, we established the combat base, my battalion, 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines. It was just below the DMZ. And they start shelling us and it was horrific. It was really bad. I mean, we had to basically stay underground all the time. If you came out, you can get killed doing anything. That's how bad it was. I get a radio call from battalion saying that Major Duffy has joined our battalion. Major Duffy, and now he's a major. I go into the hatchway and there's Major Duffy sitting right in the hatchway. I mean, and there was like a, a place where you could sit. And I said hello to him. And um, I walked in, spoke to the battalion commander, and on the way out, he was still sitting in the hatchway. And, and I, a thought went through my mind and said, uh, I hope he's not like, you know, gonna, you know, settle in in the hatchway. Because it, it, it was a, where he was sitting was big enough to, you know, lay down and sleep. And I walked away, right? I walked away. Went back to my bunker, and we got hit with another barrage of artillery and rockets, and they radioed down, and he was, that he had been killed. Duffy, you know, they wrapped him in his poncho, poncho rotation, and they brought him over to the LZ, and the last I saw of him was they were loading him on a chopper and sending him back to the Okinawa, which was an aircraft carrier. When, when they brought him in, when they brought him back to Okinawa, a Marine officer saw, you know, saw the chopper come in and saw them unload the remains of, of Duffy. Shortly after that, this Marine officer, a few days later, he gets on a chopper and he flies to Alpha 3. So he makes it to the command bunker 
he, and it's incoming, and he goes into the hatchway and he runs over, gets under a table with, under the table is the battalion commander. They're both under the table, and he says, um, the battalion commander says, you must be a Lieutenant Jones. And, and he's like, sir, yes, oh, Lieutenant Jones, uh, reporting for duty or something. And, and the first thing the, command, the commander, the battalion commander says, see, that hatchway over there? Major Duffley was killed there a couple of days ago. These are, these are letters that I wrote to my wife. Uh, these are all uh, letters while I was in the Marine Corps. Was this, um, but I have another box of letters that I wrote to my dad, my mom, my sister, and some of my friends. So what happened is in 2002, all these letters were returned to me by my ex-wife, 2002. And at the same time, by coincidence, my mom returned all the letters that I wrote. But these letters start in Nam. The letters I wrote to my mom started in boot camp in Paris Island. So all of a sudden, in the summer of 2002, I had these letters. I, haven't, I had no idea they, they saved them. So I started reading them. And something happened. One day, Nikki walked in and she said to me, you have to do two things for me, meaning her. You have to get help. And why don't you write? And I did it. She saw something that, you know, that I didn't, going on. And she did, I didn't sense it or anything I could. So I got into a writing class in uh, September of 2002 at Southampton, which I have never done. I never, I never wrote anything. And I got into counseling at the same time. And I went, I went to counseling, you know, on a regular basis. But then the counselor said, you have post-traumatic stress disorder. And I got angry. And I stopped the counseling. This was in 2002. But I continued with the class. So the first story I wrote was Double Time Duffy about uh, Duffy and what happened to him. So the writing, which I didn't realize, is another form of therapy. There's a lot of vets right now, and, they, and, every, and all of them, I think, claim it's some form of therapy. The VA discovered something, just a routine exam. Uh, up in the clinic. They did an EKG and the, the doctor, it's, it's very strange, he, he takes me out into the hallway and he says, you have an abnormally low heartbeat. And it turns out that I had this really bad heart disease called chronic ischemic coronary heart disease. I started doing a little research about Agent Orange and sure enough, the VA came out with a new reg specifically addressing what I had. And they said, if you have this and you were in NAM, it's presumed that Agent Orange gave it to you. So I added another claim, Agent Orange. And um, I'm at the point now where I'm over 100% because I can't work anymore between the heart disease and the loss of hearing. And Agent Orange is, um, um, I call it the agent that keeps killing. I never really said I was bitter about, you know, anything about now, but the Agent Orange thing really bothers me. Because those motherfuckers, I'm talking about the government, they never told us anything about Agent Orange. There was no such phrase when we went to Nam. We, know, we knew they were using some type of defoliate. We knew because we saw them spraying it. We were drinking Agent Orange. It was in the water. We were bathing in the Agent Orange. And we had no idea what, you know, what we were doing.